Welcome to uh, session three. This is Waiting for a Wedding Day. Um, the outline in your books is on page um, 102. Page 102. So the past, we talked... The past three weeks, we've talked about waiting for the Lord in general, and then we talked about waiting for significance, and last week was waiting for a father. This week is waiting for a wedding day. And these, these three talks, significance, father, and wedding day, these are all like just really foundational talks. These are where, if we can get these things right, um, I think so many of the other things will shift and fall into place. And if we kind of will understand so many, I think, the aches and the pains in our hearts and our lives come from those three weights, from the weight for significance, from the weight for father, from the weight for a wedding day. And if we can really do the necessary work, sometimes painful work of healing in these areas and understanding how we're waiting and so often what we fill our hearts with to distract or numb and press into the Lord, I think we'll be amazed at the healing that comes. So just to encourage, encourage us today um, in this journey, and I hope you enjoyed the homework this week on waiting for a wedding day. I, it, was a, it was sort of a, a different take. Um, I love the life of Jacob. I don't necessarily love events in his li- certain events in his life, but he's truly like the, a postmodern person, I feel like, in ancient Hebrew literature. Um, and it's, so, it's illustrated so vividly, his search for a wedding day to be someone's beloved, someone's favorite, someone's firstborn. And this constant struggle you see for his struggle for a blessing. And he had really forced me in my own search for a wedding day. What was I really looking for? And is that something that ever a spouse can really fulfill? Did God make it so that a spouse could fulfill that? And so we're going to talk about that today. Um, And we're all in different places um, in our wait for a wedding day. Some of us maybe are single and have never been married. Some of us maybe were married but are divorced or were separated Some of us are married happily, but we're married to a sinner, right? And they're married to a sinner. We're all sinners in here. No marriage is perfect. Um, And some of us might be married, but it's it's a tough marriage. And we're left hurting and aching a lot, wanting something more. And um, several years ago, I was part of a conversation with a woman. And we were talking about, it was at lunch, and we were talking about being Christ's beloved. You know, you hear that, that term, the beloved. And this woman is married. I think she has a great marriage and children. Her marriage is fine. But she said when she started to read this book, and I cannot remember what book it was, but about being the beloved of Christ, she just started to weep. And she said, I don't think I've ever been anyone's beloved. And it took me so off guard because I thought, I mean, she has a good marriage, you know, but there's a profound difference between having a spouse that loves you and maybe you love your spouse, but feeling like you're someone's beloved. I mean, that's a powerful word. And I think we all feel that way. We all at least want that. We all have, because it's a God-given desire in us, not to just be loved, not to just have a wedding day, but really at the, the heart of the matter is that what we're waiting for is to be someone's beloved, cherished, and for someone to say, I choose you, someone strong, someone compassionate, someone who's wise, someone who's bigger than us, so to speak. And I really believe that's a longing in every woman's heart on planet Earth, no matter your age or stage of life. And I really believe it's a longing put there purposefully to be fulfilled by only one. And um, <clears throat> in Jacob's wrestling match with God that you saw in the homework Perhaps you saw something of your own wrestling match you've had with God, either in your singleness or in your marriage. And I want to encourage you today to not let go, just like Jacob. And if you haven't done the homework, there's time for that. You can go back at any point. But that story of Jacob wrestling with the angel who turned out to be God himself, don't let go because he has blessing for you. He wants to change your name for whatever that name of despair or um, not chosen or not wanted, unwanted or whatever you feel like that name is on you. Your name in Christ is the beloved. It's chosen. So don't let go until that weight has been fulfilled. And, you know, until we see Jesus face to face, it's never going to be fulfilled completely. 
but we have, we will fill that in part while we are here to press into that. Um, in order to do that, in order to kind of understand um, a little bit of how to press into that and how to hear God's voice over us saying that we're, we are his beloved. I want to do something a little different. Um, we're going to have fun together discovering, I hope it's fun, an amazing truth in scripture and then apply it to our lives and our waits for a wedding day. So you've got to kind of put on with me your English literature hats that maybe you took off after high school English and never wanted to put on again, but I'm going to ask you to put it on with me this morning or today. I'm sorry, I'm a little congested this morning. Welcome to Houston allergies, right? <clears throat> but this all started about 10 years ago. I began reading this book called Art, The Art of Biblical Narrative by Robert Alter. And preparing for this lesson, the first time I ever taught this, and I really, you know, this was this study was born out of a singles class. Jason and I teaching singles, and of course, they were all waiting for a wedding day, um, or most of them were. And I, I just didn't want to teach the same old conventional lesson on waiting for a wedding day because I feel like this wait applies to married and singles. And so I was really praying, Lord, show me how to teach this. Show me how to see this through the lens of Your Word. And I, and so I was reading this book, and the pieces just started coming together. Robert Alter is a Jewish scholar. He's a professor of Hebrew and comparative literature, or at least he used to be 10 years ago, at the University of California in Berkeley. And he studies the scriptures in a unique way and from a Jewish perspective, which is always helpful when looking at certain parts of the Old Testament. And he puts before his readers that the Bible isn't mere, meant merely to instruct, but it's also... It's a piece of literature, and just like you have to read um, uh, mystery novels in a certain, uh, mysteries in a certain way, or, or like you have to read poetry differently from how you read narrative, or you have to read narrative dif- or fiction from how you read fact, we have to read certain parts of the Bible through certain literary lenses. The prophets are going to be read through a different lens, perhaps, than um, the Psalms or the Song of Solomon. Um, the, the, the historical books and the narratives are going to be read differently um, from the prophet. So it's all, you have to learn how to, just like you would with any good piece of literature, read it through certain lenses. Um, and so with the help of the Holy Spirit, I want us to put on a literary lens today and of, of narrative as we learn about archetypes and type scenes. Now, some of you might be shuddering, okay, because the last time you heard that was when in English you learned about Homer or the Iliad. Um, but don't tune me out here, okay? This is on your outline, archetypes and type scenes. An archetype in literature is the standard who does certain things in a certain way at a certain time. An archetype is the standard who does certain things in a certain way at a certain time. This can be a standard for the good guy or the bad guy, for the hero or the tragic hero, the villain or the discoverer, okay, like um, Ulysses, or the sage, or the prophet, or the warrior, or the warrior princess, or the beautiful maiden, or the queen, like Helen, or any of these names, like triggering anything in your heads. But every culture has classic literature from which their archetypes are drawn, whether they realize it or not, okay? So you and I and our kids are able to interpret the characters from the new Star Wars, like Rey and Finn and Princess Leia and Kylo Ren and Darth Vader, um, because of standards of archetypes like Beowulf, <gasps> yuck, Sir Gawain, King Arthur, Guinevere, Sir Lancelot, Merlin, Achilles, Ulysses, set for Western culture and Western literature hundreds or even thousands of years ago. So when we go and we sit in a movie theater or when we pick up a modern day piece of literature, whether we realize it or not, we're able to interpret the author's intent because of archetypes that were set for us in Western literature. And other cultures or continents are going to have different archetypes drawn from their canon of literature. And so it's important to think about who or what these are. And because archetypes help us define and understand culturally what is good or evil or heroic or tragic or beautiful or ugly, um, it's really important to understand each culture's archetypes. Okay? And how we do this is through something called a type scene. This is on your outline too. A type scene is an elaborate set of tacit agreements between artist and audience about the ordering of the artwork. An elaborate set of tacit agreements between artist and audience about the ordering of the artwork. 
It is at all times the enabling concept in which the complex communication of art occurs. It's the enabling concept. Okay, in other words, all right, this is on your outline. The type scene is what enables communication to occur between the artist and the audience. It's what enables the artist to make his or her point about war or love or marriage or romance or money or power or whatever through the medium of art or literature or painting or music or film. And a type scene enables us to recognize patterns of repetition or symmetry or contrast and to, to see what is innovative or deliberately traditional. All right? So I'm going to explain this further in just a minute. Classic type scenes our culture draws from are Knights of the Round Table, Lessons about brotherhood and friendship, unity, Lancelot and Guinevere, adultery is wrong, true kings are true to their wives, true queens are true to their husbands, Braveheart or Beowulf, courage and honor in battle, cowardice is shame. Okay, these are classic type, she- type scenes. Modern day archetypes and type scenes. When you and I go to a movie theater, sit down at our, on our couch with Netflix and put on a, a romantic chick flick, there's an archetype hero that we're, that we're looking for. He's handsome, he's wealthy, and he's clueless, right? <laughs> the heroine is beautiful with it, maybe a little clumsy, and she's smart. Here's the type scene. They meet, they hate each other. Then they're attracted to one another and fall in love. Something happens to split them apart, then they get back together, get married, and live happily ever after. Where do we get that type scene from in Western literature? Pride and Prejudice. Jane Austen, okay? She gave it to us. It's the standard for many chick flicks from which archetypes and type scenes are drawn. Mr. Darcy, Elizabeth Bennet, the wayward sister, Lydia, the good sister, Jane, the villain, Mr. Wickham, the fool, Mr. Collins. Okay, and this is on your outline. This is what's so key, and I had to give you all that to tell you this, okay? The artist's point is made both by what elements are the same and by what elements are different in the type scene. The artist's point is made both by what elements are the same and by what elements are different in the type scene, okay, according to the classic archetypes and standards. So let's go back to our example of a, of a chick flick and what we think, what the typical or classic type scene is in our head and the archetypes. But the artist is going to, or the filmmaker is going to make his or her point by what's the same and what's different. Like the guy is ugly instead of handsome, yet the girl still loves him in the end. What story is that? Feeding the beast. Or the girl is ugly and the guy still loves her in the end. Bleak House by Charles Dickens. Powerful story. If you've never read it, okay? I just gave you the the ending, but there you go. (laughs) Sorry. Spoiler alert. Or the guy is little and still gets a chance at being a hero and playing in the game. Rudy, okay? Now, it's things like the girl is pregnant, but the guy still takes her in, or is expected to take her in, or it's two guys who fall in love, or two girls who fall in love, that can tell you about what's changing in a culture, okay? Or about a culture's system of guilt and shame, or morals and models. And by these type scenes and archetypes are how a culture defines what's normal or accepts what's a deviation from the normal, okay? But all of this is set for us through these type scenes and archetypes, whether we realize it or not. That's why when you're on a plane, okay, if you've taken international flights and you sit down and like the Japanese, these Japanese movies come on or the Bollywood movies and the Indian people, the people from India around you are laughing or the Japanese people and you're like, that's because we don't know their culture's archetypes and type scenes. We don't know what's supposed to be shameful or what's supposed to be funny or what's different, okay? Now, here's the thing. All of these rules apply to scripture. All of these rules. To read the Bible according to what genre of literature it is. But the problem with reading ancient Hebrew literature rooted in ancient Jewish culture is we think it's all normal, right? We have no idea what the type scene is, what's supposed to happen, and then therefore what's different. And what the original audience who was hearing it would have gone, (gasps) okay, we're just like, well, yeah. Yeah, he rolls the stone away or whatever it is, okay? We miss the divergent elements because we don't know their archetypes or the elements of their culture's type scenes. So 
altar helps explain this. That's why he's so great. Because he does understand ancient Jewish type scenes and archetypes, he's able to unfold some things for us. So this is what he says. Not every type scene will occur for every major hero. Though often the absence of a particular type scene may itself be significant. Some of the most commonly repeated biblical type scenes I've been able to identify are the following. The Annunciation. Um, of the birth of the hero to his barren mother, the encounter with the future betrothed at a well, the epiphany in the field, the initiatory trial, danger in the desert, and the discovery of a well or other source of sustenance and the testament of a dying hero. What I would suggest is that when a biblical narrator came to the moment of his hero's betrothal, Both he and his audience were aware that the scene had to unfold in particular circumstances according to a fixed order, okay? So when you're reading along in scripture and you get to a big scene, a betrothal scene, like in, um, as we're going to see, Isaac or Jacob or David or Moses, the audience knows there are certain things that are supposed to happen, just like we do with our chick flick, okay? Okay. If some of those circumstances are altered or suppressed, or if the scene were actually omitted, that communicated something to the audience, as clearly as the withered arm of a sheriff would say something to a film audience, okay? So while the the audience who knows this is going, oh, and getting it, it's just going right over our heads. So what I want us to do today is to learn how to read a betrothal type scene from an ancient Hebrew perspective. All right, so we're all going to walk out of here smarter than we ever knew we were going to be. And this hopefully will last a lot longer and be more beneficial than anything you learned from Homer. Okay, so when you're reading scripture and you come to a major event in the life of David or Moses or Abraham or Isaac, you can stop and think, how does this normal and how does this deviate? What is similar and what's different? Okay, and ultimately... How does this all point to Christ? And this is where Robert Alter kind of stops and where I picked, where, I, where we're going to pick it up, okay? Because as Christians, we believe it really isn't the Old and the New Testament. It's the Bible. The whole thing is meant for, we cannot understand what's the New Testament without the Old Testament. It's full preparation for what we know about the life of Christ so that when he steps onto the scene, when the word becomes flesh, it should be an aha moment for all of us where we go, oh, this is what the prophets were talking about. This is what every type scene for every major character was building to, Christ in the flesh. And so that's why it's so important for this to stick and for us to know, how does this compare to the life of Christ? What's similar? What's different? Because how the patriarchs from the Old Testament chose a bride all point to and get us ready for how Christ chooses his bride. For these stories are there for us to learn from, again, so that we can recognize Christ when he comes. So let's look at your outline. These are taken from Robert Alter. These are the five element, fixed elements in a biblical betrothal type scene. Okay? So what are the five elements? According to to Robert Alter, there are five. All right, so they're all on your outline. There's some blanks underneath, but just look at the five major points. Number one, the future bridegroom journeys to a foreign land. That's the first thing that every reader would be looking for. The future bridegroom journeys to a foreign land. Number two, there he encounters a girl at a well. He encounters a girl or girls, plural, at a well. Usually the girl is, and this is important, beautiful, a virgin, And family. She's usually some sort of cousin. From here on out, she is going to be known as the BVF, beautiful virgin family. Okay? That's who he's looking for. Number three, he or she draws water from the well. He or she draws water from the well. This is sort of a fixed and divergent element depending on who's drawing the water, as we're going to see. And number four, afterward, the girl rushes home to bring news of the stranger's arrival. Rushes home. The words hurry and run are usually always given significant emphasis. And number five, a betrothal is concluded. Usually only after the stranger has been invited to a meal. 
Betrothals concluded usually only after the stranger has been invited to a meal. So we're going to look at, at two different examples before we get to the life of Christ. And remember, it's what is different is the thing that stands out. The divergent elements in a type scene are how the author makes his or her point. It's the divergent elements, okay? So I want to read about the very first betrothal in Scripture, Isaac and Rebekah. Remember, whenever we read something that's a first in Scripture, we have to pay special and close attention because it sets the standards for all others that are to follow. So this first one, Isaac and Rebekah, is kind of long and detailed, but it sets the standard for all other betrothal type scenes. So I'm going to read, and as I read, I want you to look for the fixed elements as I read. So there are blanks underneath your five points. The first one is I and R. It stands for Isaac and Rebecca. So as I read, listen for these fixed elements and jot down the verse reference when you hear it. Okay? So as I talk about a future bridegroom journeying to a foreign land, write the verse down, number down beside the blank. And there are blanks for Isaac and Rebecca under all five points. Okay, this is in Genesis 24. I'm going to read one through four, and then I'm going to skip down. Now, Abraham was old and advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in every way. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he owned, please place your hand under my thigh, and I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you shall not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I live. But you shall go to my country and to my relatives and take a wife for my son, Isaac. Skip down to verse 10. Then the servant took ten camels from the camels of his master and set out with a variety of good things of his master's in his hand. And he arose and he went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at evening time, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord, the God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show loving kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, I am standing by the spring and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now may it be that the girl to whom I say, please let down your jar so that I may drink and who answers drink and I will water your camels also. May she be the one whom thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. By this I shall know that thou hast shown loving kindness to my master. And it came about before he'd finished speaking that, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Abraham's brother Nahor, came out with her jar on her shoulder. And the girl was very beautiful, a virgin, and no man had had relations with her. And she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please let me drink a little water from your jar. And she said, drink, my Lord. And she quickly lowered her jar to her hand and gave him a drink. Now, when she'd finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw also for your camels until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran back to the water, the well to draw. And she drew for all his camels. Meanwhile, the man was gazing at her in silence to know whether the Lord had made his journey successful or not. Then it came about when the camels had finished drinking that the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel and two bracelets for her wrist weighing ten shekels in gold and said, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me, is there room for us to lodge in your father's house? And she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. Again she said to him, We have plenty of both straw and feed and room to lodge in. Then the man bowed low and worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his loving kindness and truth toward my master. As for me, the Lord has guided me in the way to the house of my master's brothers. Then the girl ran and told her mother's household about these things. Now, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban and Laban ran outside to the man at the spring. And it came about when he saw the ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrists, when he heard the words of Rebecca, his sister saying, this is what the man said to me. He went to the man and behold, he was standing by the camels at the spring. And he said, come in, blessed of the Lord. Why do you stand outside since I have prepared the house and a place for the camels? So the man entered the house. Then Laban unloaded the camels and gave straw and feed to the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him. But when food was set before him to eat, he said, I will not eat until I've told my business. And he said, speak on. And then two more verses, verse 50 and 51. 
Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The matter comes from the Lord, so we cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before you. Take her and go. Let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. Okay, that was long, but necessary for all of our fixed elements. Okay, number one, the future bridegroom's journeys to a foreign land. You see that in verse 10. The servant takes 10 camels and goes back from Canaan back to Mesopotamia. It was a long journey. So he has to go on a journey. Number two, he encounters a girl at a well. Usually the girl is beautiful, a virgin, and family. Okay, 11, he encounters, he goes to a well, and he meets Rebecca. She is, it's spelled out very clearly, she's beautiful and she's a virgin. And then we find out she's also family. Okay, she is related to Abraham's brother. And then in verses 17 through 20, Here, she draws water from the well, okay? And she waters his camels. Um, And number four, she rushes home to bring news of the stranger's arrival. Verse 28, she runs home and tells her mother's household about these things. And then um, the last one, a betrothal is concluded over a meal. Verse 33, the food is set before him. And verse 51, the betrothal is concluded. And Rebecca goes with him back to... Um, she goes to Canaan for the first never to see her family again and marries Isaac. So what are the divergent elements, right? These are on your, this is on your outline under C, examples, divergent elements. So this is how, remember, the author of Genesis is trying to make his point about this type scene. Um, number one, Isaac is conspicuous by his absence. Isaac is conspicuous by his absence. Remember, a fixed element is that the future bridegroom journeys to a foreign land. But who does the journeying here? The servant. Isaac is definitely the most passive of the patriarchs. All right? And in every other betrothal type scene, this is the only place where the bridegroom is absent, is that someone else is standing in his place. And he is the most passive of the, of the patriarchs. He is most famous for being the bound victim, right, for whose life a ram is substituted and then for being deceived by his son Jacob and by his wife Rebecca as a weak, blind old man. So this is definitely, and here's another literary term, foreshadowing, okay, as to what his character is like. Number two, the d- second divergent element, is that the girl, not the man, draws water from the well. The girl, not the man, draws water from the well. Rebecca is always a whirl of activity. You see this in verses 18, 19, 20, 28, 58. Um, She quickly lowers her jar. She quickly empties her jar. She runs back to the well. She runs and tells her mother's household. I mean, she's just, okay. Um, This also foreshadows, she is one in control and she sets the pace. She's going to in her household too. She will quickly take matters into her own hands and help her favorite son, Jacob, deceive his father and steal her older brother's blessing and leave her family in chaos, okay? So whether we, you realize it or not, the original audience is listening to this going, ah, getting all these things from this type scene while we're just like, well, of course she's running around. I mean, you know, so <clears throat> it can tell us a lot about the original characters. All right, let's do one more before we get to the life of Christ. Jacob and Rachel. This one is quick pace dialogue compared to the first one. So again, Under your five fixed elements, there are blanks, J and R. That stands for Jacob and Rachel. So as I read, listen for the fixed elements and then jot down the verse reference. This is going to be in Genesis 29, um, verses 1 through 13. Then Jacob went on his journey and came to the land of the sons of the east. And he looked and saw a well in the field. And behold, three flocks of sheep were lying there beside it. For from that well they watered the flocks. Now the stone on the mouth of the well was large. When all the flocks were gathered there, they would then roll the stone from the mouth of the well and water the sheep and put the stone back in its place on the mouth of the well. And Jacob said to them, My brothers, where are you from? And they said, We are from Haran. And he said to them, Do you know Laban the son of Nahor? And they said to him, We know him. And he said to them, Is it well with him? And they said, It is well. And behold, Rachel his daughter is coming with the sheep. And he said, Behold, it is still high day. It's not time for the livestock to be gathered. Water the sheep and go pasture them. 
But they said, We cannot until all the flocks are gathered and they roll the stone from the mouth of the well. Then we water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she was a shepherdess. And it came about when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went up and rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and lifted his voice and wept. And Jacob told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and that he was Rebekah's son. And she ran and told her father. So it came about when Laban heard the news of Jacob, his sister's son, that he ran to meet him and embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his house. Then he related to Laban all these things. Skip down to verse 16. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. The name of the younger was Rachel. Leah's eyes were weak, but Rachel was beautiful of form and face. Jacob loved Rachel, so he said, I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter, Rachel. And Laban said, It is better that I give her to you than than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of his love for her. Okay, what are the fixed elements here? Number one, Jacob journeys to um, a foreign land. That's verse 1. Genesis 29, verse 1. He went on his journey and came to the land of the sons of the east. Um, Abraham's servant as well. Eastward is all, and just by the way, in scripture, eastward is always pointing away from the Lord. Pagan people, God's judgment, okay? That anytime you see east. Number two, there he encounters a girl at a well. Usually the girl is beautiful, a virgin, and family. Verses 2 and 9. He encounters her at the well. And verse 9. Again, okay, 2 and 9 are the well. She is beautiful, verse 17. We just are assuming here that she is a virgin. Doesn't say clearly. But, and then verse 10, she is family. Laban is her father. And then the third fixed element He or she draws water from the well. Verse 10, Jacob draws water from the well. That's that's an important point, verse 10. The fourth one, the girl rushes home. That's verse 12. She runs home, tells her father. And then the last one, a betrothal is concluded, usually over a meal, verses 13 through 14. A betrothal is concluded, and, um, and really verses 16 through 20. The betrothal is concluded over seven long years, okay? And he lives with them, assuming there are lots of meals eaten. Okay, what are the divergent elements? What point or points is the author trying to make about Jacob and Rachel? This is the bottom of your page on the outline. Number one, Jacob has an obstacle to overcome, wrestling the stone from the mouth of the well. All right, scholars are very perplexed by this. This is strange. Um... Along with the kiss. Do you notice that? He meets her, he wrestles her, and then he kisses her. That's odd. Okay. Jacob throughout his life was known as the heel grabber or the wrestler. He tackles adversaries with his own two hands. And he wrestles with his brother, his father, with God himself. So it makes sense that he's going to have to wrestle here. It sort of foreshadows his relationship with Rachel as well. He ended up having to have 14 years of labor to have her as his own. And once married, they had a tumultuous relationship. It was not an easy marriage. Wells also were a symbol of fertility, so it's appropriate that it's blocked by an obstacle. For seven years, Rachel was barren in their marriage, and she dies giving birth to their second son. So there is this theme of a stone in Jacob's life. He sleeps on them, he wrestles with them, he contends. And again, as one of the patriarchs, Jacob foreshadows Christ. Christ is the cornerstone upon which he builds his church, his family, his people, his name. So again, all of this is pointing us in that divergent element is really an interesting one with Jacob. Um, All right, so I'm sure you're wondering, what in the world does this have to do with our wait for a wedding day? Okay, so let's get to that. I'm glad you asked. This, uh, I want you to read on the next page of your outline is a quote by Robert Alter. And he says this, The type scene is not merely a formal, a way of formally recognizing a particular kind of narrative moment. It is also a means of attaching that moment to a larger pattern of historical and theological meaning. 
If Isaac and Rebecca, as the first man and wife, born into the covenant God has made with Abraham and his seed, provide certain paradigmatic traits for the future historical destiny of Israel, any association of later figures with the crucial junctures of that first story, the betrothal, the life-threatening trial in the wilderness, the enunciation of the blessing, will imply some connection of meaning, some further working out of the original covenant. You can underline that. That's an important part of that quote. The fact of recurrence, however, is as important as the presence of innovation in the use of the type scene. And the convention itself, the origins of which may well antecede biblical monotheism, have been made to serve as eminently monotheistic purpose, to reproduce in narrative the recurrent rhythm of a divinely appointed destiny in Israelite history. That's a chunk. That's a mouthful. But what he's saying is this. Any time you're going to see the recurrence of this type scene, In Israelite history, it is a flag. It is a major sign to us saying this is a further working out of the original covenant. The original covenant that God made with Abraham back in Genesis 12, and that he carries on through Isaac and then Jacob and so on. Anytime you see that in their line in scripture, another betrothal scene, another trial in the wilderness, another annunciation, the birth of Um, of a child to a barren mother, it is a huge flag to us saying the original covenant is being worked out here in even greater detail. And it reproduces this rhythm of divinely appointed destiny in Israelite history. These are not random type scenes. This isn't just a random betrothal. This is for us divinely appointed to say, wake up, what is this telling us about Israelite history? And as believers, our history, okay? Alter stops it here. He stops with the Old Testament. And I was reading it the first time I read this 10 years ago. I was like, child in the wilderness? Annunciation to a, a, a woman who's barren? You know, a betrothal scene by the well? I mean, it was just light bulbs going off. It, gave, it was like a key that unlocked the whole Old Testament and story of Christ to me. Because all of these things, all of these things in our Bible exist to point us to this divinely appointed rhythm and pattern to Christ, to the one who is the fulfillment of all archetypes and type scenes. They were given to the Jews and to us, again, so we could recognize Jesus, the true betrothal and true bridegroom when he came. So I want to look at one more betrothal scene, the one to which all the other scenes point, all right? So if you could open to John chapter 4, we're going to look at Jesus and the Samaritan woman. Betrothal by a well. John chapter 4. I'm going to read, and again, this is the last time you'll do this, but there are spaces for you to jot down the verse, the fixed elements. Um, It's J and SW, Jesus and the Samaritan woman. So I will read from John chapter 4, and y'all can jot verse references down. When, therefore, the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, Although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. Okay, is this not a deal? This is like the announcing of a type scene, right? Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is, to, who, it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. The well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. 
The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so I will not be thirsty, nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. At this point, his disciples came and they marveled he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot, went into the city and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all the things that I've done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. In the meanwhile, the disciples were requesting him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. The disciples, therefore, were saying to one another, No one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months? Then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, that they are white for harvest. Skip to verse 39. From that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Okay, so let's unpack this. This is our text for the remainder of the time. Number one, the fixed element, the bridegroom journeys to a foreign land. This is verses one through six. Verses one through six. And this is on your outline, um, betrothal by a well, under fixed elements. Jesus is the very present bridegroom who has left his father's house to seek his bride among the sons of the East, just like Isaac and just like Jacob. What I love here, okay, this is a fixed element, but let's not miss the significance of it, all right? The bridegroom is not absent. It's him. God did not send a servant or a stand-in or an angel or representative. He sent himself. And he is hot and he is tired He is fully human. And Alter says, to discover a mate in the world outside is figured in the young man's journey to a foreign land. This is why Jesus came. Do you understand, or do you see later in the text, his disciples, I love the disciples, they're such idiots sometimes, and it's so comforting, okay? They're like, "Um, did y'all bring him food? Did someone bring him food? And he's like, no, no. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. You have, I have food to eat you, you know nothing about. He's basically like, guys, this is why I came. This is my eternal destiny being worked out at the side of this well with this woman from Samaria. There are just red flags going up all over the place. Type scene, betrothal, well, and the disciples, these good Jewish boys, right? They're just missing it. And Jesus is saying, look at what I'm doing. Look at what's being worked out here in Israel's history, in your history. So I love this. He is not absent. And he has to go to the sons of the East. Remember, East always represents away from the Lord. He had to leave the comfort and the security and the perfection and the beauty of his father's house and go to hot, sinful, war-weary earth. And he did. That's what's so amazing. He came. He came. Fully human, fully God. And notice, I love this in verse 4. I have this circle in my Bible. And he had to pass through Samaria. He had to. Jesus didn't have to do anything. He had to because the Father told him to. 
because this is a further working out of the original covenant. He had an appointment for Israelites' history and for your and my, and for, your, for our history by Jacob's well that day. And did you notice in verse 6, he goes and purposefully sits smack down at Jacob's well. Again, hello type scene, right? John is trying to make it so clear to us what's happening. And after verse 6, the narrative slows down and becomes incredibly <coughs> specific. So the next fixed element is this. He encounters a woman at a well. Usually the girl is beautiful, a virgin, and a family. All right? In verse 7, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. So this element is both fixed and divergent. It's fixed because he does encounter a woman at the well, all right? But it's divergent because she is definitely not a BVF, okay? She's not a virgin, and she's not family. No idea whether she's beautiful on the outside or not. The text doesn't talk about that, and it's not an important detail. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. The third fixed element, he or she draws water from the well. We see this in verses 7, 13, and 14. This is both fixed and divergent. Both Jesus and the woman draw water. She draws water in verse 7. He's thirsty. And he does it in verses 14 through 26. Okay? He gives her a different kind of water. <coughs> But this, even though this is a fixed element, okay, this is such a radical move because of the identity of the woman. There, um, an excellent book. This guy, his name's Kenneth Bailey. He is an amazing scholar. Um, he wrote a book uh, several years ago. I just was so perplexed when I would read the, the New Testament at the parables of Jesus. I just didn't understand them. And I was like, I don't understand most of what Jesus says. I'm just left scratching my head. So my brother um, is my go-to for questions like this. And I said, what do I read? And he said, um, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes by Kenneth Bailey. And it is just a powerful book that really helps to unpack parables of Jesus. And Kenneth Bailey lived in the, in the Middle East for a number of years, lectured over in the Middle East, and um, really under, understands Middle Eastern culture. And so much of it has not changed in 2,000 years. And what he explains is this. Because she was a woman, the expectation would be upon seeing her, Jesus would have courteously withdrawn at least 20 feet, indicating that it was safe and culturally appropriate for her to approach the well. But Jesus doesn't move, okay? And the woman approaches anyway. Think about it. In Middle Eastern society today, a strange man does not make eye contact with a woman in a public place. Most women are completely veiled, all right? He wouldn't make eye contact contact with her, much less talk to her. And in um, Hebrew literature, ancient Hebrew literature, rabbis were instructed not to talk to their wives in public, much less a woman you don't know, okay? So this is radically different, all right? By deliberately, and this is so interesting, by deliberately sitting on the well without a bucket, Jesus places himself strategically to be in need of whoever appears with the necessary equipment. I love this. Um, Bailey explains that still today in Syrian markets, all right, because so much in the Middle East is desert, there are these portable leather water buckets that are sold, and that's your water bucket. You don't go on journeys. You don't travel without your portable leather water bucket. Now, they they had one. The disciples probably took it with them when they went to the market, and Jesus could have said, I'm thirsty. Leave the bucket with me, but he doesn't for a reason. He purposely humbles himself, so he needs her help. And in doing so, he elevates her self-worth by talking to her and asking her to help him. Isn't that powerful? He does something similar with Peter when he meets Peter. And um, Peter's catching fish. And he says, hey, can you give me a ride to the other side of the lake? He He puts himself in dependence on Peter, God Almighty, who could have walked across the lake, right? It's just the humility of Christ. He was constantly thinking of ways. How can I elevate people? How can I love them well? By showing them a need. So this is on your outline. We see in just three short verses, verses 7 through 9, in asking this woman to draw water, Jesus breaks three huge cultural taboos. Number one, he talks to a woman. He talks to a woman. Number two, 
he ignores a 500-year hostility between Jews and Samaritans. Jews and Samaritans hated each other, hated. They once had been united under Israel when the Assyrians came and conquered the northern part of Israel. The Babylonians later conquered the southern part. When the Assyrians did that, those people assimilated into Assyrian culture and came up with this like mix of Judaism and paganism. And they worshiped false gods. They had a different temple site. And the Jews would, wouldn't even walk through Samaria. They walked way around. So, because even to touch their land was defilement. They had wanted nothing to do with them. So he talks to a woman, a shady woman, all right, at that with a shady background who's drawn well in water in the middle of the day, which was a huge indicator she wasn't welcome when the women were drawn water at the normal times. He ignores a 500-year hostility between Jews and Samaritans. And number three, he drinks after a Samaritan, causing personal defilement. He drinks after a Samaritan, causing personal defilement. The literal translation of verse 9 could read, For Jews did not use vessels in common with the Samaritan. Why? Because the Jews would be defiled. Because defilement came from the outside in. All right? You couldn't touch a dead person, according to Levitical law, because it would make you unclean. You couldn't live in a house with mold. People would have been in big trouble in Houston, right? You You couldn't drink after a person... Um, or you couldn't eat certain foods. You couldn't, um, I mean, I mean there's just all these rules about defilement. You, you couldn't touch anything dead or unclean or eat or drink certain things or let certain things touch your skin um, because of defilement. So to drink after a person who worshiped a false god or gods as a rabbi, Jesus was considered a leader, a teacher, complete defilement. And you, could, and you can understand this in verse 27, the disciples are amazed. They walk up to him and basically are like, what are you doing? You're talking to a woman who's a Samaritan drinking after her. Right? They could have knocked him over with a feather. All right, we're going to talk about what that means in just more in just a minute, but let's keep on with the, the um, fixed elements. The fourth element is afterward the girl rushes home to bring news of the stranger's arrival. That's verses 28 through 29. And haste is implied because she's in such a hurry. She leaves her water pot and then comes right back with these men. And then the fifth fixed element, a betrothal is concluded usually only after the stranger has been invited to a meal. Verses 26 through 42. This betrothal is concluded when the woman realizes the identity of Jesus and she accepts it. So much so that she invites others to come and sit down and be fed right along with her. Right? And this meal is both physical, he stays with them several days, breaks bread, and spiritual. There are two kinds of food mentioned in the text and two kinds of meal meals. His food is to do the will of the one who sent him. But he also physically, literally breaks bread with them as he stays with them for several days. That's implied. All right, so what are the divergent elements? There are things that... The author, John, is telling us to the fixed elements, but there are also points he is making to the divergent elements. This is on your outline. The primary divergent element in this type scene is the identity of the bride. She is clearly not a virgin, and she is clearly not family. She's clearly not a virgin. She's clearly not family. Again, this passage says nothing about her physical appearance. We don't know if she was beautiful. <coughs> But this woman is not a virgin. In fact, she's had five husbands and is living with a man at the time who's not her husband. Verses 16 through 18. And John almost goes out of his way to emphasize the condition of her shame, not to hide it. And this woman is clearly not family. She was a Samaritan, a hated enemy of the Jews. She was the antithesis of what they would have thought of as family. She was defiled and a Gentile. All right? So this is nothing less than amazing. I don't want this to, the significance to be lost on us here. The good Jewish son of God, the word become flesh and the bridegroom has come down from heaven to seek his bride. And his choice is a defiled, adulterous woman from Samaria outside the original family of God. This text signifies to us sitting in this room, unless you are 
um, born of Jewish family, okay, this is great news for us, right? A major shift has just occurred. The Gentiles have just been essentially said, you're part of the family. You are now part of the Israel of God. The temple is not in Jerusalem. This whole dialogue that he's going on, has going on with her about, but I thought you said we have to worship in Jerusalem. And he says, no, no, no. The day is coming. God seeks worshipers in spirit and truth. No longer is the temple about a certain specific location anymore. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. You don't have to say your prayers in Hebrew. The temple is about to be his body. The language of God is the language of the redeemed heart. That's why now we have Bible translations. We're working towards every language, right? It's not just one language. We have been grafted in. And I love this. How does Jesus treat her? What does he offer her? Okay, this immoral woman who is a defiled Gentile. And this is on your outline. The second divergent element is the nature of the drink he offers her. He does not offer to satisfy her physical thirst. He offers to satisfy her spiritual thirst and to quench her guilt and her shame. He has her admit who she really is. And then he tells her her whole story. Isn't that beautiful? It's just like, think when we read in Genesis 3 with God, with Adam and Eve in the garden. He makes them tell them exactly where they are and what they've done for their good. There's no freedom unless you do that. If he had just glossed over the details and left it standing between them, you're just a nice lady who's given me a drink. Well, I have eternal water for you, but not brought up the fact of the five men she's been with. She would have felt like it wouldn't have been a blessing at all. It's just like Jacob. You have, God blesses us with the full knowledge of all of our sin, all of our mess-ups, all of our failures right there. Otherwise, it's not a blessing at all, who we really are. And you notice she tries to change the topic, okay? I perceive you're a prophet. Um, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you people worship in Jerusalem, right? And he doesn't let her get away with it. He brings her back to what's offered her. And this is on your outline. Jesus lets her know that worship isn't about being in the right place. It's about being at the feet of the right person. Forget about Jerusalem, right? Forget about that temple for a minute. I who speak to you am he. I love what Bailey says here about this. He says, Jesus treats the woman as a serious theologian and reveals to her the most important teaching on worship in the entire New Testament. Let me just pause. Anyone who says that Jesus treats women badly or that the Bible is negative towards women doesn't know what they're talking about. They're bad. They're they're doing poor research and reading bad scholarship. Jesus elevates women to a worth that most men even today don't elevate women to. Who does he appear first to after the resurrection? A woman. A woman's testimony wasn't even considered to be held up in court. He didn't care. He loves women. Who does he allow to touch him and deliver for the the bleeding woman? He loves women. Women followed him. They were part of the group of his disciples and paid to support him out of their means. Mary and Martha. I mean, if anyone, it's just... Anyone who says that Christianity is derogatory towards women, I'm not saying that certain Christians aren't derogatory towards women, and that is just heartbreaking. Jesus never was. Jesus loves women, okay? So once again, Jesus elevates her as a person, and in the process, all women with her. The phrase, I am, that appears here in the Greek text of John is the exact phrase that's used in the Greek Old Testament to translate the Hebrew of what God said to Moses at the burning bush. Moses asked who was speaking to him, and the voice from the bush said, I am. And when you look at um, John 4, verse 26, he says to her, I that am talking to you, the literal translation is, I am. I am. The Gospel of John records a list of I am sayings. The list includes, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the true and the living way, I am the vine. Amazingly, this famous series opens with the self-revelation to the Samaritan woman. 
The psalmist wrote, Say to my soul, I am your salvation. William Temple (coughs) observes, That is the assurance that we need, that he whom with we know we have dealings is none other than the eternal God. If my soul can hear that word, then it can rest. I need the divine assurance of the divine love. What Jesus, I never knew that until I read this, that literal translation of verse 26, Jesus says to her, I am. It was not lost on that woman what he was doing. He was telling her, the one who just told you your whole story, the one who just drank from you, the one who was willing to risk outer defilement from you, the one who is looking at you in the eyes, and maybe the first man ever to treat you with dignity and respect, I am. It's I am who's speaking to you. And I am is offering you water. Water that will cleanse you from your outward defilement. Because my feeling is, probably she didn't choose to be with five men. I don't know, maybe there was some sort of sexual... um, abuse in her background. Maybe there was sexual slavery going on. I don't know. Most women don't choose that. That's all I know. Maybe he was the first man to look at her and say, I'm giving you water that will cleanse you from all kinds of defilement, all kinds of shame, all kinds of guilt. And just so you're certain of who's offering you this drink, it's God. It's God. And he opens the famous I Am series, the seven statements of John, with her. How powerful and how beautiful. Total love, total acceptance. And what does this woman do? Does she go, let me think about it. She say, well, I mean, maybe I believe you. She completely receives the drink, all right? Drinks it down and runs back to the heart, to the town and brings everyone out to Jesus. And verse 39 says, from that city, Many Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, saying, he told me all the things I've ever done. You can only say that to someone when your shame has been lifted, right? We only have the power to tell our stories about the broken places in our life when the power of the darkness has been broken over us. That, that drink that Jesus offered her cured her like that. How powerful is that? One more thing we learn from Jesus in his choice of a bride And this is on your outline. Defilement doesn't come from the outside. Defilement comes from the inside. And we don't run the risk of making Jesus dirty. Instead, Jesus makes us clean. He makes us clean. Joanne Thompson has a book called Table Life, and she says this, Jesus isn't at risk of catching the disease of sin because he eats with sinners. Sinners are at risk of being drawn to grace by eating with Jesus. As believers, as Christians, I feel like so often we live the reverse, don't we? We don't want to be around people who act a certain way or do certain things, or we even instruct our kids, uh, don't hang out with them. And, and there's, there's wisdom in that, okay? I'm not saying, but we're like afraid we're going to catch sin from sinful people. Light always trumps darkness. It just does. That's the nature of light. You walk into a dark room, you flip on the light. Which one wins? The light. Every single time when you have light, it always pierces the darkness. Jesus always trumps sin. Always. That's who he is. He is not worried about getting dirty from the defilement of this woman. He is clean in and of himself. And you see this over and over again in Scripture the way he lets lepers touch him, the way he touches, uh, the way he lets women who are bleeding touch him, things that a Jewish person, and according to Levitical law, would have had to run to the mikvah or the the cleansing bath to get clean. You never see Jesus doing that. It's because he, in and of, of himself, has the power from the inside out to make us clean. And what I want to ask you and, and I today, this is really the point here, what if, if Christ chose her with her background, with her story, with her guilt, with her shame, what makes you think he's not chosen you? And if the drink from Christ's cup could satisfy her, if she was so ashamed to the point she was in the well in the middle of the day, couldn't be with it, could 
couldn't even go be with the other women. And all of a sudden, she has she is so free from one conversation with Jesus, from this one encounter with I am. She runs to her town and brings everyone back because he told her everything I've ever did. How do we think that Christ's drink and his cup could not also satisfy us? If it made her clean, why do we think we're still dirty? And if he chose her as his beloved, what makes us think we're not his beloved? Because this Samaritan woman is our archetype. We need a new archetype in Christian culture. And the the irony is she's not new. She's been here for 2,000 years. We just haven't had the eyes to see it. But she is our archetype for the bride. She is our archetype. If you feel ostracized or lonely or wounded or guilty or shamed, welcome. That's what the bride looks like. That's the prerequisite. You want to be the, the the beloved of Christ? And I love, again, the ambiguity about her background. We don't know um, if she, she could be the victim, forced prostitution, gang rape, sexually abused, or a sexually immoral lifestyle by choice. We don't know. The ambiguity is there for a reason. But the point isn't how dirty is she is. The point is how clean Jesus is able to make any of us. And I want us to hear today, you are who I came for. You are the reason I sat down beside Jacob's well. I choose you. And when we respond to him, to his invitation to be his beloved, just like the Samaritan woman, a few things have to happen. This is how we're going to close. What does our betrothal look like? Number one, this is on your outline. We must choose to be his and drink from his cup the remedy for our shame. This is on your outline as well. As Christian author Henry Nouwen writes, we not only are the beloved, but also have to become the beloved. We not only are the beloved, but we also have to become the beloved. When we respond to him and we drink his cup and we say, yes, your water brings me eternal life, we instantly become his beloved, right? It's like Mia Grace that we talked about last week, our youngest daughter who we adopted from China. The moment we, st- we took her to that embassy, to the American um, embassy in Guangzhou, and you had to stand there and say, I will protect this child. I will, you know, she is mine forever, so help me God. Boom, she's mine. She just went from orphan, adopted in a moment. I mean, I'm telling you, the hair stands up on your arms. It is powerful. Like it or not, she belongs to us. Now, is she still two and a half years later working out the implications of her adoption? Is she becoming a daughter? Yes, she became a daughter in a moment, but she is still becoming a daughter. Same for us. We become the bride of Christ in a moment, his beloved, his chosen. But every day is a choice to work out the implications of our belovedness. I love what Henry Nouwen says says in his book, Life of the Beloved. He says, um, Becoming the beloved means letting the truth of our belovedness become enfleshed in everything we think, say, or do. It entails a long, painful process of appropriation, or better, incarnation. What is required is to become the beloved in the common places of daily existence and bit by bit to close the gap that exists between what I know myself to be and the countless specific realities of everyday life. Becoming the beloved is pulling the truth revealed to me from above down into the ordinariness of what I am, in fact, thinking of, talking about, and doing from hour to hour. It's pulling the truth of who we are, who we are in Christ in the heavenlies, irrevocably set for all eternity down into the existence of daily life. And how that happens, we allow, this is on your outline, we allow the living word to apply the written word to our hearts. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27 says this, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all of her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blameless. How does he sanctify us? He cleanses her through the washing of water with the word. 
And the problem is so often we want a bubble bath and he's like, I got to scrub you down. This is going to hurt a little bit, right? It's like when your kid comes in with a, a wound and they're crying, oh, mommy, it hurts. And you're like, well, sit, I got to clean it. That's the worst part, right? That's normally the bath that Jesus is talking about. It hurts to cleanse the wounds, but that's what he is in the business of doing every day. And that's what we allow him to do as we allow him to pull, we pull the truth from who he says we are down into our everyday moments, our everyday hurts, our everyday wounds. And then on your outline, B, we must choose to be continually satisfied no matter the circumstances of our brokenness. It's a daily drink and a daily choice to be continually satisfied by him, to forgive our spouse, to be content in our singleness, to believe that outwardly we're wasting away, inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And I saw that powerfully played out in the life of my friend Kathy McDaniel. Today is the year anniversary of her going home to be with the Lord. And I will never forget a few weeks before she passed. It was probably about six weeks. And all of us who were close to her had different jobs. Some of it, One of us had, was in charge of the meals. Okay? One of us was in charge of the play dates for her kids. Another one was in charge of the schoolwork for her kids. I mean, we all had to do different things. And my job at the end there was to help her say goodbye through words. And so when it, the end was getting close and it was clear that unless the Lord did a dramatic healing, he was going to take her home. She'd been fighting cancer for three years and she was emaciated and she had no hair and she was so sick on the outside. But inwardly, she was being renewed day by day. She was so strong in the joy of the Lord and in the hope of the Lord. And I'll never forget going to her about six weeks before she had to pass. And I said, Kathy, it's time for us to write letters to your kids. you got to write these. And she just started to weep. She said, how do I say goodbye? How do you do that? And we just held each other and cried. It was one of the most sacred, painful conversations and time periods I've ever had in my whole life. And I just, we just started to pray. And I, and I, I, all of a sudden, as I prayed, I had this picture of Kathy. And again, she's, she's frail. She's gaunt. She's no hair. And I promise you, it was like the glory of God filled that room. And he gave me a picture of her and she was beautiful. She was in a wedding dress and all of us were helping her get ready. Some of us were helping with her veil. Some of us were helping with her dress. Some of us were giving her flowers. And the Lord said, you might think she's going for her death day, but she's going to her wedding day. She's going for her wedding day. And it's your job, all of you together, to get her ready. And let me tell you something. Every day, you and I have a choice. One day, yes, we will die in this flesh, but we will go to be married, united to the Lord. And the last image that we have in scripture isn't a daughter, it's a bride. The spirit and the bride say, come. And we sit down at the wedding feast of the lamb. That is our reality. That is our reality, no matter what we see here or feel here. And that is what gives us hope and joy in the midst of the pain of the everyday. We may not feel like anyone's beloved in the here and now, but we are his beloved when we know him. And we are to help each other. We cannot do this. That has become so clear to me with every passing year, and even with Kathy's death. We cannot live this out alone by ourselves. We have to have the body to do this together. We help each other understand the reality of who we are as the bride of Christ and to prepare for our wedding day. We need each other to do that. And the last point is this. We must choose to make our meal the will of God and to invite others to the feast. Just like the Samaritan woman. Stop using your brokenness to hide behind. Stop using the shameful details of your story as a screen or as something to be afraid of and let Jesus use it to push you out from behind into a broken world to be his mature bridal partner. We are going to have all of eternity to be the bride, radiant, beautiful. But right now he's looking for the wife. You know what I mean? Like the mature partner 
to partner with him and go out into the weary, worn, dark places and be his wife, be his bride, to turn the light on and to invite others to the feast. Your brokenness and your story is something that others need to come to the table. Just like that Samaritan woman. If she had kept her mouth shut, a whole town would have suffered. There are people in your schools, in your life, in your family, in your back that need to hear the story of your brokenness and how Jesus has healed you so that they feel confident enough that he will let them drink his cup too. That's what's at stake here. It's not just a fuzzy, beautiful, warm picture about a bride. What's at stake here is eternity and our souls and in the lives and souls of other people. Each of us is a beautiful bride and our brokenness becomes beautiful when in the hands of Jesus who loves us and accepts us and invites us to invite others to his table as well. So let me, let me close with prayer. Father, we thank you that we are your bride. Those of us who know you and love you and have fully received the salvation of Jesus Christ, we are the bride of Christ. Whether we feel like it or not, whether we have cancer or not, whether we're divorced or married, whether we're single or married, whether we have lots of children or no children. And Father, what we know for a fact is that heaven is coming. It is coming just like it came for Kathy. It is coming for us. We ask that you would let us live out the reality of our brideness well here on this earth as the mature partner of Christ seeking a lost world. I ask for healing for all of us in this room from our stories, from the brokenness of our past, from our marriage, Lord. And let us get to the point, just like the Samaritan woman, where we hear, I choose you. Drink my cup. Be healed of your shame, of your guilt. Be firmly rooted in your identity as my bride and go out and share your story. We love you, Lord. We thank you that you choose us. Let us hear your voice over us today, calling us your beloved. It's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.